Welcome to A Celtic State of Mind. I'm Paul John Dykes and we continue today with our daily Axome podcasts. Day 15, podcast number 15. And I'm going to be looking back at the centenary season and in particular, Neely Mockin. Back in 2015, you may be aware that I wrote Neely Mockin's biography, Celtic Smiler. On the back of that, there was a documentary adaptation which I was one of the producers of. That gave me the opportunity to speak to a lot of ex-Celtic players who had experience of working alongside or under Neely Mockin, as well as a lot of Neely's family members. It was a great experience, and you can actually still watch that documentary on Amazon Prime. And for a limited period of time, you can watch it on YouTube. We've managed to put it up on YouTube during these times where people are isolated and may wish to watch some Celtic history in the comfort of their own home. The book itself became a hugely rare Celtic book. It was quite unusual for a modern Celtic book to become rare so quickly. And it has become a very sought-after biography, which unfortunately on Amazon has changed hands for astronomical amounts. A Celtic State of Mind will put that right in the coming months because we will republish that book as a paperback and there will be a lot more content within the book including new interviews that I have conducted since the release of the 2015 first edition. I've also got a foreword by John Clark, the Lisbon Lion, who someday hopefully will write his own book. Version 2 of that book, which is about 30,000 words more than the original, is now available as a PDF. All you need to do is get in touch on my Twitter page and tell me that you wish a copy of that book and I'll email it out to you. When we finally get round to publishing the updated version, it will be fully updated from the PDF version, so you're getting an unreleased version of that particular book. One thing I quickly realised when I was writing books is that the interviews you actually do for them are more or less put in a vault and never seen again. One or two paragraphs or anecdotes from the interviews make it into the book. The rest of the material, which is highly intriguing and amusing, lies in a vault, never to be heard again. And that actually was one of the reasons for starting a podcast, to get the full interviews with these figures out there for Celtic fans to enjoy. There are quite a few of the interviews that I did for the Neely Mocking documentary, which I'm going to tap into for a series of podcasts on Neely. The first one is focusing on that memorable centenary season, and I'll be speaking to Celtic striker Andy Walker, who we bought from Motherwell that year, and who went on to be our top goal scorer. He enjoyed two spells at the club, and got to know Neely Mocking very well. What are your memories of joining Celtic in 1987, and what was Neely's role at that point? I've got fabulous memories of uh, coming to Celtic. It was July 87 and uh, I'd pretty much been tapped up with Celtic because my old man had been in contact with one of the one of the directors, uh, Jim Farrell, and I was at Motherwell at the time and he'd approached my old man around uh, February. Would your son be interested in coming to Celtic? And my dad didn't tell me until we were knocked out of the Scottish Cup. We had a pretty decent year that year at Motherwell, and we got knocked out, I think, in the quarterfinals with Dundee United. And then my old man said, um, told me that Celtic were going to come and get you in the summer. And uh, I played the last few months at Motherwell uh, with just a huge smile on my face because the prospect of going and signing for Celtic was just fabulous. And Yeah, I've got to say, I was a bit starstruck because when I went into a, a new dressing room at Celtic, Celtic are my team. I'm one of eleven children. There's seven boys in our in our house, and my old man took us to games since I was five, six years old. Um, so some of our best memories as a family are, you know, jumping over the gate and going to see Celtic in big games against Rangers, big games in Europe, semi-finals at Hamden, uh, cup finals at Hamden. My uh, childhood memories are full uh, of all that. In fact, Big Billy's last game, uh, 75 Cup final against Airdrie. Uh, it was one of the first big games that I was at. I was only 10 years old. So um, my whole childhood was dominated by fabulous uh, Celtic memories. So to go into a dressing room where not only was Big Billy the manager, um, but I was pretty much playing alongside some of my heroes, Paul McStay, uh, who was the same age as me, but I'd been watching him play for Celtic for two or three years. Um, Roy Aitken, Pat Bonner, Tommy Burns, some fabulous names that uh, uh, I've been at Celtic for, for so long and had played in 
successful teams and that was all I was interested in I just wanted to be part of the team and part of a team that had success and I know Billy took me aside when he signed me and he said look I'm not going to make a big splash about you signing I think they paid about 350, 400 grand and um, he said look Davy Proven is retiring so we're going to announce that and I'm also going to announce the signing of Billy Stark and that should take the pressure off you and it'll bring you in and um, and I, I remember it as if it was yesterday because it was fabulous. So I had, I had three years at Motherwell and actually I was getting married that year. So uh, my wife was really happy because I signed for Celtic. We got married shortly after that and we had a honeymoon. Well, we didn't really have a honeymoon. We had two days up at Glen Eagles and then I went for 10 days to Sweden uh, with Celtic. So um, great days. Really great days, and uh, just uh, what was awaiting you? How how are you going to fit in? Where are you going to fit in? And how is the team going to do? Because Rangers were spending a lot of money. They had a really good side. Big Billy had come back. There were so many changes. We'd lost Murdo McLeod and Alan McAnally. David Proven had retired. Brian McClare had moved on to Man United. Uh, there was a lot of changes. So, um, But I was in the same boat with Billy Stark. Chris Morris, who was a new player, Mick McCarthy, and um, but we were made to feel really welcome. Of course, great, uh, great setup, great boys. Training was terrific, and really enjoyed uh, the preseason. Now, Neely Malkin was in charge of the kit. Could you tell me what the process of trying to obtain a pair of football boots was like around about that time? Well, that, that was my first experience of meeting Neely Mockin, who, of course, everyone who was a Celtic fan knew Neely and his history and, you know, the goals that he scored and that fabulous left foot of his. And um, when I first came up to the ground, um, I, I pretty much came up with nothing. I went in very early because I didn't want to... I didn't want to be late in any way, so I went down to the ground. We had to be in for about 10 o'clock. I was there for about quarter to nine and there was no one in and Neely Mockin came into the dressing room and um, how you doing? Uh, about a chat and we were going up to Strathclyde Park for training, he told me that uh, I was braced for all that and all I had was um, training shoes and I asked him if it'd be okay if I could uh, get a pair of football boots and he said Bits you want a new pair of Bits? New, new bits, son. You're only on the door two minutes. And I thought, jeez, what's he, what's he talking about? This is kit, man. Give us, a, give us a pair of boots. And I remember the dressing room at Celtic, which I hadn't been in before, of course, but there was this huge storage space at the back. And Neely went up and uh, opened it. You could see all this stuff that was in there. I think he kept absolutely everything, strips, boots, gear, and this was July 87 I signed for Celtic and he gave me a brand new pair of Adidas World Cup 82 boots it was in the stitching they were brilliant boots and I used them in pre-season we went to Sweden uh, we played three, four games over there and um, the boots were fabulous but I always remember nearly saying that Bits, a new pair you're in the door two minutes and you want a new pair of Bits <laughs> what have we got here? And uh, that was Neely, and that was his style, and um, he was great. Going into your first pre-season in 1987, was Neely Mocking able to assist you or guide you in any way to make an impression on your teammates and the management staff? Yeah, I went over and uh, really keen to make an impact. We went to Sweden, played a couple of amateur sides, and uh, I was struggling to make... uh, a bit of an impact. I think I played about three games and um, hadn't scored. But I remember the first game because I didn't play well. And uh, I know it was the centenary year, but we weren't wearing the centenary strips. We were wearing the old C.R. Smith, just with the Celtic uh, crest. And uh, I think nearly saw I was a wee bit, a wee bit despondent, a wee bit too keen to try and impress. And... Uh, he came up to me quietly afterwards and said, you keep that jersey, son. That's your first. And I gave it to my brother, which uh, I think he still has. 
I hope he still has, but it was a nice touch from uh, Neely. And he tended to do some lovely things with uh, various players. I mean, he wasn't all this great, uh, you know, gruff voice that you would hear and, you know, taking the mickey out of everyone and laughing at some of your attempts at, uh, you know, trying to score a goal or winning big games because he could always come back at you with fabulous tales of some of the teams that he played in and some of the goals that he scored. Now that centenary side had a magnificent spirit. How big a part did Billy McNeil's backroom team play in that? Well, it was the the backroom staff played a huge part in, in, in my view because any time when we went to play a big game, we'd go down to Seamill uh, to prepare for a European game, semi final or final, and you'd always have Neely Mock in there. And he'd always be sitting with Billy McNeil, Tommy Craig, and of course Jimmy Steele, who was a fabulous. Uh, guy to have around your um, squad of whatever it was, 15, 16 players. He would bounce off everyone. His patter was magnificent. He would keep everyone at ease. He'd be chatting up the youngest girls who were, you know, serving us our dinner, just having a laugh with them all and making us feel so comfortable. And um, uh, I, I loved those days uh, going down to see Mel. Um, I always thought it was a great pity when Liam Brady came into the club and he just didn't like it he didn't like it, he felt as though Seamill wasn't plush enough it was too far away from Glasgow but it was a it was a fabulous uh, set up and I loved going to Seamill because if you're going to Seamill you're going to prepare for a big game and we always had these tremendous um, games on the grass just in front of the hotel and losers into the sea, which was a uh, always made it really competitive, and uh, invariably it was we we always I think we tended to play the married men against the single men, and uh, of course I was one of the young ones and I'd just get married, so uh, that was great. I was in with I was in with Roy Aitken, Tommy Burns, and um, uh, we t- <laughs> I think we won more than we lost, so it was it was always a good laugh. Neely Mocking had seen and done it all in a Celtic jersey. How important was he in the lead up to the big games and, and these semi finals and finals at Hamden? I don't remember him coming round and, you know, nearly saying anything to me individually, but I do remember seeing him and uh, you know, having a quiet word. I think it was more or less the experienced players and we had a big experience, um Pat Bonner, Roy Aitken, Tommy Burns. I I remember nearly being around them. Um, He always tended to be doing something with their boots, changing their studs or uh, whatever. And he he was always in and around the dressing room. He was always in and around uh, Big Billy. So when Big Billy did all of his work and addressed us as a group, sometimes Billy would come over and and address me and Frank as a partnership. Um, if, if we Joe, we Joe was playing, you know, the three of us up front, he would address the three of us together. But he would always retreat into the back corner, and it was always Billy, Tommy Craig, Neely was there, and Steely as well. Sometimes he'd give Steely a nudge, get up and give them a bit of your chat, and he'd go through his spiel. Um, and Neely was uh, quietly going around, just doing his own thing. He, he wasn't one for a you know, making any sort of grand speeches. He was always quiet. He was always in the corner. He was always saying, uh, just quietly, quietly spoken. And it was a real contrast to that sort of, when you approached him in front of people and he had this sort of gruff manner and would always slap you down, but with a bit of humour in it, which was uh, typical of Neely. And um, no, these, these guys were a huge part of what was a really... Uh, successful season and of course we all know the the type of legacy that guys like Billy McNeil have got with his European Cup winning exploits but uh, nearly in the Coronation Cup and playing against Rangers, beating them 7-1 scoring all these goals and that left foot of his that uh, he would he didn't bring it up all the time but once or twice when he brought it up uh, Grant he was always the one who would you know tease a He's a wee story out of him, and he could, he could get into him. And while he was watching the racing, maybe for having a, 
a player soup a few hours before kick off in a pre match. Granny be the one that would uh, get a good story uh, out of Neely and uh, they had they had a fabulous relationship. I think they were particularly close. Neely was famous for keeping players' feet on the ground, and none more so with yourself at half time during a game against Dundee where you had scored a couple of goals and you were three nothing up. Well, it's one of the it's my favourite story about uh, Neely, and just summed him up uh, to a T. And uh, I, I was so keen to make an impression early on and be part of a successful team and just look as though I deserve to be here because. My first game at Celtic Park hadn't gone well. We'd been hammered by Arsenal 5-1. A lot of new players in the team. I think all the supporters were wondering, what what are we going to get here? We didn't play well. But the season did start uh, well for the club and for me. I was scoring goals on a regular basis. I think around about October, November, we played Dundee at Celtic Park. And Jim Duffy was playing for Dundee. I thought, class player, Jim. And I'd made a really good start to the game. I'd scored two goals in the first ten minutes. We came in at half-time. We were 3-0 up. It was a horrible day. Uh, Howling wind and rain. And being up against Jim Duffy, I remember chasing a ball into the corner, uh, just down the far side, over the jungle side. And he just gave us a bump, gave us an elbow. And he left, sent me flying onto the the track. So I was covered head to toe in uh, this uh, blaze, this ash. Uh, I was... I was wet, I was soaking, soaked to the skin. And I remember the half-time whistle going, thunderous applause, we're 3-0 up. Um, we're playing well, and again get into the dressing room, and over to see Neely, and I'd take my strip off. I said, Neely, any, any chance of getting a new strip? I'm, this, this is manky, it's soaking, and any chance of a new strip for the second half? A new strip, son? No, you're not playing well enough. And the daft thing was, he was right. I'd scored two goals, but my game was about you know a good touch, bringing others into play, uh, linking up. Um, and I hadn't been playing well. The touch was awful. I'd scored two goals, uh, lucky enough to do that. But Neely was right. I hadn't played well. And you just accepted it. Aye, aye, you're right. So I went back into the dressing room. I'm wringing out my strip. Uh, I'm trying to sweep off all these uh, ash from the uh, strip putting it on the, the radiator. I mean, even my shorts uh, are soaking. Uh, you don't get a change of anything. Back out uh, for the second half of this soaking strip on uh, the second half that's really uh, manky for a red blaze. And it was fine. We won 5-0. And um, I think it might have been Joe Miller's debut. And Joe scored, played really well. I get two. I'm sure Frank scored as well. But it was a right good team performance. Um, I think I played better in the second half and I didn't score. But uh, that was nearly. Not a chance you were getting a new strip because you only played well enough. After Billy McNeil departed, how did Neely's role change under Liam Brady? My recollection of the changes was, uh, I mean, it certainly didn't work out for me. Liam Brady coming in and taking over from uh, Billy McNeil. And, you know, that was fine. I think... When I look back, my, I'd, I signed a four-year contract and I'd stayed there for four years. I think looking back, I was pretty much a regular for the first couple, played every played every week. The last couple, you know, Billy was changing it. We were still chasing uh, Rangers and uh, Jack Janowski came in, Tommy Coyne came in, uh, John Hewitt uh, came in at various stages. Uh, when Liam eventually took over from Billy... He told me immediately I wasn't part of his plans, which was absolutely fine. I'd had four years, four years more than I, I thought I would get at, at uh, Celtic, and I was happy to move on. Uh, there was no no gripe on my part, but um, I, I seem to remember in those early games when Liam was trying to make a bit of a, an impact, I don't think Neely was as close uh, to Liam. Liam certainly didn't want to be close to, to Neely. He wanted his own team in there. He brought in Mick Martin. Uh, there was other guys around him. And uh, I think Neely was uh, a wee bit uh, on the periphery of things and just a different feel to the club. Uh, Billy is in the fabric. Billy McNeil was in the fabric of, 
Celtic and their history and no one would ever you know, question his place. Um, Liam had come in a bit like Graham Souness, uh, totally, totally new, totally fresh, no management experience uh, whatsoever. And uh, it was taking him a, a bit of a while to come, I think, to come to grips with the, the size of the club, how to deal with um, not just a, a match day, but just being a Celtic manager every day in life. And I thought Billy was great at handling the press. Uh, he could tell them one thing. Um, and he would actually say to us in the dressing room, listen, I'm going to tell a few of the bre- press boys this. Don't believe a word of it. It's just, just for them. And um, I don't. I, I can remember feeling ten feet tall under uh, Billy McNeil because uh, my first old firm experience when Billy Stark scored the winner one 0 at Celtic Park. Um, I can remember coming in at half time, being as high as a kite. We were one 0 up, and uh, Billy was just laughing. I'm looking over at uh, Neely who was standing beside him, and um, he's looking at Neely and he's saying, "Are playing some of the." Some of the best football I've ever seen in an old firm game. I mean, better than anything we could come up with. I mean, when I think of it now, I mean, not a chance were we playing as well as any of the you know, Lisbon Lions or whatever. I mean, the, the, those guys stand alone. But Billy was saying this to us, a new team, new players, and he's bouncing it off nearly, and it's coming back to us, and we are just feeling 10 feet tall. We're going out into the second half, we play even better. We get this 1-0 victory. Graham Souness gets sent off. There's a tremendous atmosphere. There's this big bust up in the uh, the tunnel after the game. Where When I came in the tunnel, I saw Billy and Neely outside the dressing room and Souness was having a go at them. And he's giving them a bit of stick about you know, uh, you know, his Man City and Villa days and Billy's giving it back. And I think Neely wanted to get in front of him. Billy's, Billy's holding Neely back and... Uh, it was just a, it was a fabulous experience for, for someone in their, their first old firm game. And I think Billy had the ability to make you feel 10 feet tall. I don't really have a relationship with Liam. I, I, I never, we never had that experience where we were all winning big games, really. Uh, so maybe, maybe he could have made you feel uh, 10 feet tall, but not in a way where... Uh, Big Billy could, so um, I, I was happy uh, to move on, and I I don't think there was that same closeness with Neely towards uh, Liam as I was with Billy. Obviously, you've mentioned being in and out of the side, Andy, during your final two seasons under Billy McNeil. Were you ever party to Neely giving Billy advice in the dugout? I do. I remember having a fallout uh, with. I remember having a fallout with Billy where he'd taken me off. Um, I think it was against. Uh, Dundee United and we lost the game 1-0 and I was I was getting the hump because I felt as though he'd been taking me off far too much in recent weeks and I said to him is that the only number you've you've got there number 10 is that the only number you hold on when you might make a change and it wasn't Billy who turned around and gave me a blast it was Neely you shut up son sit back there and just watch the rest of the game. So there was about half an hour to go. And uh, whatever else happened. And Frank, I thought, Frank was our top man at the time. Frank McAvenny, best striker I ever played with. And he missed a chance. And I'm looking at Neely. Oh, Billy, get him off as well. <laughs> and this was in the midst of a game. And, you know, and Billy's throwing his throwing something to the ground. And, you know, Neely's winding him up to say, oh. Get him off. I always remember the story Frank tells me about the time he, I think he'd scored four goals against Morton at uh, Capolo and nearly saying, hey, get him off. Because he didn't want, he didn't want him to get the five goals where, that uh, nearly had scored uh, in his time. I don't think Frank had taken off. I think he says he did, but I don't think Billy uh, took him off. Um, but uh, no, these were all, uh, th- this was all part of uh, Billy's management style. There were the dugouts, if you remember, at Celtic Park, very low. You sat down, no one was standing except when you came out of the tunnel. And it was always Billy, uh, Tommy and um, and Neely. And they were always in the front. I think sometimes Steely 
Steely might have been in the front once or twice, or, or he was in at the back with the. And it was just the two subs, uh, of course. So it wasn't this team of uh, sports scientists and uh, masseurs and doctors and five subs now that uh, you get uh, enormous area, the technical area now. It's not even a dugout anymore. But uh, Neely was very much part of it, and uh, I, I'm sure, having spoken to Billy numerous times over the years, he, he, he did look once or twice over to, to Neely for, for a spot of advice. Sometimes he'd get a bit of humour, uh, and of course he had a close relationship with, with Tommy Craig, but um, there were times when uh, I'm sure Neely would give him a wee nugget uh, of information. And when you left Celtic, when you finally left Celtic, were there any words of advice from Neely, who had made that move himself down south back in the 1950s? No, there was no real farewell. Um, I remember uh, my departure from Celtic was, um, I wouldn't say it was sour in any way. I knew I was, uh, I knew I was leaving. Uh, there was a daft story about you know, Liam Brady, who was actually, when he when he came into the club, he said, look, Andy, you're not going to be part of my team, and, you know, if you can get yourself a club, you know, move on, and that'll be it. And um, I think when I left, players weren't moving as freely as they once were. A lot of clubs were spending money on the, their ground. The Taylor Porter had come in after the Hillsborough stuff. They were still spending money on doing up their ground. And... Um, there was an offer for me to go back to Motherwell, to Tommy McLean. I didn't want to go back to Motherwell. There was another offer in from Falkirk under Jim Jeffries. It was, I think it was about 150 grand. I didn't want to go to Falkirk. I just wanted to go to England. I just wanted to go down south. I wanted, wanted something new. And I not back Falkirk. And Liam, was, uh, Liam wasn't happy. And he pulled me in the next day and he said, if you don't go to Falkirk, I'm going to stop your wages. And I said, Liam, what are you doing? This you're only in the management game two minutes, and you're uh, you're already behaving like Jim McLean. I mean, I, I'm just going to bide my time and go to a club that I want to go at. And around that time, I, I was training with the uh, Liam had asked me to go and train with the reserve sometimes, which was fine because Bobby Lennox was looking after him. Training was really good. A lot of the young boys were great trainers: uh, Lex Bailey, uh, Jerry Craney, Jerry Britton. Some good lads there, Stevie Fulton, all trying to knock on the door of the first team. So the training was good and I enjoyed it under Bobby, but um, it was only once or twice at that stage. I, I didn't leave, I think, until the late January, February. And uh, nearly, I remember, just taking my side. It was only once and it was a sort of, it was a nothing day. It was a Tuesday afternoon. And he said, uh, just hang in there, Andy, some, something good will come for you, I know it's not happening just now but you'll get something and uh, there was nothing gruff in his voice, there was no humour in it it was just a moment where you know, I think he maybe felt as though I was banging my head against a brick wall trying to get away and uh, nearly saw it and, uh, just a nice touch he was a, he, he was a mixture of, of everything uh, nearly. and when I come back to the club Ninety four, I came back for a couple of years, and that was when I realised he had uh, uh, leukaemia. And I remember being pre-season, we were over in Dublin, I think, over in Ireland, and I mentioned that I could see Neely still doing what he was doing after the game because all the strips would would take their gear off, would put it on the uh, on the dressing room floor, and Neely, of course, was going around and he's picking everything up. And I saw some of the young boys that were there and they were doing nothing and. Hey guys, come on! Got nearly a hand and mentioned it to Paul, uh, who was the captain, of course. And uh, Paul gave him a, a bit of a rocket. And I don't know what we could do. We all knew that Neely was struggling. We all knew that he didn't have the same energy levels. Uh, he was sleeping a lot, which wasn't like him. You know, you'd catch him. You know, just falling asleep in a chair or maybe going through to the, you know, where we used to have our plate of soup and he might be, you know, just having a wee nap in there. And obviously he was being drained of of, of all his uh, energy. And um, uh, it was horrible to see him not have that uh, spark, that, that level of, of energy and drive and 
you know, that great face that he had when he was up watching the watching the racing. He loved the horses and I don't think he ever won. <laughs> I don't remember ever coming in happy because he'd won a bit. He was always he was always second or third or it was nowhere to be seen, his horse. Um but uh, no, he was great. Always great company. Always part of, you know, the the best memories I have with Celtic as a team and going with, going with some of your teammates to to Seamill, to away grounds, uh, to big games, to Ibrox. Uh, Neely was always part of the dressing room and part of you, part of your preparation, part of your celebration when you when you had a right good result. And um, uh, it was always a hard school sometimes when you you know you lost the game and <laughs> it wouldn't happen to us. <laughs> he played in great teams and uh, he would always bring you back down to earth if you ever thought about getting ideas above your station. So fabulous Celtic name, fabulous history he had, and um, just so pleased to have to have known him for for as long as I did. There's an infamous story which I think originated from Peter Grant, where some of the boys tried to get nearly back with a practical joke. Were you part of that prank? I think I was injured. I didn't go. I wasn't there. Maybe it's one for Granty to tell. Remind Granty of the time where we're all at the table and uh, I think nearly... It was Granty that sort of put it in front of them. They were waiting in all these steaks. There was this bowl of pepper sauce and Granty put it in front of them and said, there's your oxtail soup. So Neely's <laughs> dipping his bread into this pepper sauce and it was absolutely roasting, it was on fire. And he was, oh, that soup has got a fair kick to it, Granny. And it was Granny that put it in front of him. And you should ask Granny about the other, uh, the time where the, I think it was the same trip, and again I wasn't on it, I was injured. Um, and they, they'd, they'd gone down, they were sitting in the, sitting on the beach, and they gave, uh, it was roasted, and uh, gave some of that suntan cream, son. And Granny gave him oil. You know, we, we used to put oil on your skin, just let your skin burn. I mean, unheard of now, but in those days you could put oil on your skin and nearly like that. Oh, brilliant. That'll give us some protection. <laughs> he was sitting, just chatting away for a couple of hours. That night, apparently, they could not stop laughing. We never nearly went. His face was just shining. <laughs> this bright red face as it was burnt to her. an absolute crisp. You should ask Granny about that one. They were the best days. Mm-hmm. I, I was playing with all my heroes and Neely was uh, Neely was just a, a great Celtic name. Andy Walker, the only thing left for me to say is thank you for sharing your memories of Neely Mocking and your days at Celtic Park. Mm-hmm.